Welcome to the Just Ingredients Podcast. I'm Cara Lynn, and here we talk all things nourishing to the mind, body, and soul. This is a place where you can find just good ingredients to life. Did you know that the majority of adults don't eat enough protein every day? Start your Just Ingredients Protein Powder subscription today for your favorite flavor to be delivered right when you need it and for 10% off. Just Ingredients Protein Powder is 100% natural with five protein sources for easy digestion and an amazing rich taste. Made with 100% grass-fed non-denatured whey, organic pea protein, organic pumpkin seed protein, organic chia seed protein, and collagen, we bring the highest quality protein to every batch. Just Ingredients is committed to its ingredient and only uses the highest quality of ingredients. Just Ingredients protein powder is naturally sweetened and flavored with real foods and contains no artificial dyes, natural flavors, or sugar alcohols. So if you want a delicious tasting, high protein, low calorie protein powder delivered on a month to month basis, start your subscription at justingredients.us and receive 10% off every month. Once again, get 10% off your subscription at justingredients.us. Andrew Kimbrell is the founder and executive director of Center for Food Safety, a law, policy, and advocacy nonprofit organization that protects people and the planet from the harmful impacts of industrial agriculture and advances the transition to an organic, regenerative food system. Through his leadership at CFS, Kimbrell has been the forefront of legal challenges to genetically engineered crops, lawsuits forcing FDA to adopt new food study new food safety regulations, and most recently, a landmark case forcing the EPA to overturn their decision that glyphosate is safe for humans and imperiled wildlife. His legal work has also helped maintain the integrity of organic standards. As an author and public speaker, Kimbrell has been a leading proponent of regenerative forms of agriculture and organic policies for over 30 years. He is the editor of the nationally renowned book, Fatal Harvest, the Tragedy of Industrial Agriculture, and the author of Your Right to Know, Genetic Engineering and the Secret Changes in Your Food. Welcome back to the show, everyone. Today, I actually am really honored to have the guests here on our show today. Like the bio said, this is Andrew Kimbrell. He is the founder of the Center for Food Safety. And I quote you guys all the time in my posts and the articles I do. So thank you so much for being here, Andrew. Well, Carlin, it's very, very nice to be with you, and I'm a big fan of your work as well. Well, thank you. Will you just tell my listeners a little bit about yourself, your background, and maybe a little bit about what the Center of Food Safety is? Right. Well, the, the Center of Food Safety is, we like to think of ourselves as the leading voice on food, health, and the environment in the United States. Uh, we link those, those three things. Um, and we were created in 1997, in December of 1997. The reason that's interesting is that was just when the organic standards were being finalized. The Organic Food Production Act was passed in 1990, and they said, okay, we're gonna have national organic standards, not just state or local, right? So putting those together in 1997, in December, Dan Glickman, who was head of the USDA under Clinton, he said, you know what? We're gonna allow genetic engineering in organic. We're gonna let a whole bunch of pesticides in organic. We're gonna let irradiation go into organic. We're gonna let you name it. And so we, uh, a couple of other groups, we formed this huge coalition to protect the integrity of organic. And that's how CFS actually started in 1997. And we were able to get GMOs, irradiation, sewage sludge as excluded methods. So we won those battles, but that's, we, we were really created to help form, create, and, and promote and protect the integrity of the organic standards. And we've done so ever since. Um, And we have this vision of um, what I call organic and beyond. You know, organic for us is the floor, the crucial floor. But above that, we want to build a future of food, Carlin, that's, that, that is a biodiverse, that's humane, that's local, right? That, that, right? that has all that's socially just. We want organic to build into all of that. We want to sort of protect the standards, but evolve the ethic. So it right. includes local and biodiverse and humane, which is so important, and social justice, which is abs- an appropriate scale. All those things you want to. Th- so we're there to fight the industrial agriculture 
and its its pesticides, its biocides, most of which we'll talk about, but also to promote the organic and beyond vision. That's that's sort of who we are at CFS. As far as me, basically a New York City kid. Uh, my greatest love when I was young was music, and um, I started my life uh, a concert pianist, and and. Um, still play all the time, and uh, but I decided to switch my hobby and my profession. So uh, music is my hobby, and now policy law has been my profession for going on 35 years. And um, graduate from NYU Law School, and um, yeah, I, I, it's been a privilege to be able to spend your life doing a calling like you're doing. You know, the, you know, to have a vocation, not just a job, but to be able to, you know, to profess. <laughs> your faith in things, and to actually have a vocation, a calling, to be able to spend your life in it is a really lucky privilege. So I feel I feel quite lucky. And um, I also am a father of two and a grandfather of three. Oh, uh, exciting. A six-year-old boy, a, a, a two-year-old boy, and a beautiful little one-year-old granddaughter who has the wonderful name of Wonder. That's actually her name. Oh, so, I love it. Uh, so like so many of your listeners, you know, we it's not just about abstract worries, you know, we want to protect these children, you know, right. from the toxins so that the that the companies are making a lot of money on. And uh, but we need to protect them from them. So it's it's a very serious business. You know, when you when you see the developing children, you know, uh, and we know that their health and their brain health, as well as everything else, is really on the line with these pesticides, which have been proven, as you know, to be neurotoxic uh, to children. So many of them. So it's right. a serious as, as you and your listeners know so well. Uh, that's a very serious vocation in itself. So I'm curious because we're going to talk about glyphosate, organic, things like that. But I'm curious, what got you passionate to create this? Do you call it a foundation? It, it's really, it's a nonprofit corporation. It's a okay. nonprofit. So it's an NGO, non-government organization, nonprofit, right? The Center for Food Safety. Well, you know, the what could be more important than being able to feed ourselves in a healthy manner to protect our health, the community, our children's health, and also to do it in a mutually enhancing way with the other non-human earth communities. Right. Right. Isn't that sort of the goal that we need to have? I think so. Well, I love that you have the passion to do something about it. Yeah, we need to also, you know, one of the great things about organic, and I know you're a huge organic fan, you know, and one of the great things about it is that for a long time, people thought technology equals progress, Right. Oh, GMOs, that's progress. Irradiation, that's progress. All these things are progress. Organic actually is kind of a revolution. It's a paradigm revolution. Because what organic says is no to these chemical technologies, no to the biotechnologies, right? No to irradiation. It says no, and that equals progress. Getting closer and closer to nature is progress, not more and more technology. So it's not only so important that we eat organic and, and feed our children organic, but it's also a huge consciousness paradigm shift that progress doesn't equal more and more technology. Progress means getting closer and closer into a real relationship with the natural world, which we are part of. Right. I love that. Okay, we're going to talk about organic in just a minute. But first, I want to start even before organic. And I want to talk about glyphosate. So let's start at the beginning for those that may be new to the health journey or new to this whole organic world. Will you just explain to the listeners what glyphosate is? Sure. Well, glyphosate is the main ingredient, right, of Roundup, which is a herbicide. And let me take a step back because I'm. This is probably second. Not, I mean, everybody knows this. Probably is listening, but just in case. So the overall name for all of these toxins is pesticides, and the categories under pesticides are herbicides, insecticides, fungicides, and rodenticides. Right? Herbicides for the weeds, insecticides for the insects fungicides for the fungi, and of course, rodenticides for the rodents, right? But the, the and, and the national law that regulates them, or is supposed to regulate them, uh, we'll, we'll show how it's probably not doing a very good job at that at all, which is a lot of our litigation, is called FIFRA, Federal Insecticide Fungicide Rodenticide Act, F-I-F-R-A. So that's, the, so people get, what's a pesticide? I don't get herbicide. So pesticide is the general name, and then under it, those categories. And Roundup is a herbicide. Okay. Right? It, it, not an insecticide or a fungicide. But I do want to quickly add something there, which is that whenever I use or anyone uses the word pesticides, that's actually a misnomer. That's actually wrong, right? It, it gives the impression that these toxins, these chemicals have been specifically designed only to kill a certain so-called pest. 
whether it be a weed, an insect, or a fungi, right? That's not the case, right? These are not pesticides. Okay. These are biocides. They are biocides. They kill living things. Mm. So, for example, Roundup doesn't just kill these weeds that it wants to kill. The formula kills frogs, right? The formula is it endangers over over one thousand over ninety three percent over one thousand six hundred species that are endangered species list are partially endangered because of Roundup. Well, those aren't weeds, right? <laughs> those those are bees and birds. And it creates cancer, it kills people. And it threatens through reproductive and kidney and liver disorders our children. Yet we, so it's not a pesticide, <laughs> it's a biocide. So I like to encourage, and by the way, the first person who came up with this is Rachel Carson uh, in 1963 with her wonderful book, Silent Spring, who may say, hey, let's call these biocides. So one of the things we do at Center for Safety, we understand that people know the term pesticides, but we emphasize that there are biocides. And much of our work at the Center for Food Safety is taking this biocidal action and stopping it and saying, you can't approve that biocide because it's killing so many species and it's causing cancer, right? So we really need to get into that new paradigm thinking. They're not pesticides, they're biocides. And you know the, the companies pretending that they're somehow carefully tailored to kill this little thing or that little thing is nonsense. And it's dangerous nonsense. Okay, that's good to know because I personally always call it an herbicide. So now on my posts and articles and things, I'm going to change it to biocide. So that's good to know. But let's explain to the listeners also like glyphosate's history. Why did we start using it so much? Well, at the time that glyphosate came about and Roundup came about, right, it was created by Monsanto. And it was viewed as it's a broad spectrum herbicide slash biocide. It kills lots and lots and lots and lots of plants that we call weeds. And at that time, it was thought to be relatively non-toxic compared to its predecessors. So there was it was a great hullabaloo. hullabaloo. Oh, this is a great broad spectrum, relatively non-toxic. It's the future. And they went from Congress and a couple of Congress people had passed second grade science. And they said, wait a minute, aren't the weeds that this is going to kill, won't they eventually become resistant? to this particular toxin, this particular chemical. And they said, oh, no, no, no. Monsanto said, no, no, it has a special enzyme in it that, that will ma make sure that no plant ever gets resistant to it. So the, so this happened in the 80s. And um, you know, people said, really? Wow, a herbicide that, gosh, plants will never develop resistance to. That sounds sort of like a miracle. Sounds like magic. And of course, it turned out to be, you know, completely wrong, completely wrong. So and, and then the explosion of the use of Roundup and glyphosate happened in the in the middle to late 90s. And that was because of the first approval of genetically engineered crops. Our right? Yes, our GMOs, correct? GMOs, right. Uh, and that's corn and soy. So right now, about 40 percent of our best farmland is in genetically engineered corn and genetically engineered soy. It's sort of taken over. And remember, this isn't the corn we eat. This is the corn that goes in, and, and most of the uh, soy as well. It goes into automobiles and goes into these horrible animal factories, you know, to feed, you know, the animals. It's not, it's not the sweet corn that we eat. So it's field corn, right? So, but 40% of our farmland is there because it's a commodity, right? Subsidized by the government to fuel our cars and, and it's used in these animal factories, right? So that is the explosion of, of Roundup was because of these plants. And the reason why is that Monsanto's scientists came up with a clever little thing. They found a little bacteria that was resistant to uh, Roundup. And they put that DNA into plants. And that meant that you could aerial spray Roundup over all of your soy, over all of your corn, and it would kill the weeds, but not the genetically engineered corn and soy that had been designed to not be killed by that herbicide. Remember, herbicides kill everything. You spray herbicide on your flowers, kills the flowers, kills the grass, kills everything green. Not in this case. So they were able to have a massive increase in the amount of herbicide because now farmers didn't have to be careful. They didn't have to be very careful with their herbicide slash biocide use, right? Because now these corn, they've been genetically engineered to tolerate it. So you can spray as much as you want. Massive increase, 
massive increase in the use of Roundup. And since then, it's been used for a number of other purposes, including what's called desiccating wheat, which just means drying out wheat and other crops before they're, you know, after they're harvested. So it's it's used ubiquitously, you know, throughout. So EPA has the job of deciding how much of the residue of any pesticide slash biocide is allowed in our food. That's what the EPA does, right? So in 1985, they said, here's this new herbicide, right? We're going to allow 0.1 parts per million as residue. Hmm. Well, by the 1990s, they saw, oh, wow, this is the, the basis of the entire biotechnology revolution. So they said, we're going to move that to five parts per million. Wow, that's incredible. In 2008, as it became more and more ubiquitous and more and, and more and more was being used, it's 30 parts per million. Oh, wow. 30 parts per million from 0.1 to 30. And there's no science behind that at all. It was simply the EPA giving in to the reality that this most widely used biocide in the world, and that's what it is. Glyphosate is the most widely used biocide in the world that they had to keep ratcheting up the amount allowed on our food because it was everywhere and they couldn't stop it. Not because it was safe, but because that was what the, or the industry demanded. Okay, so how did it get everywhere? Is it because then we came out with the GMO sugar and the GMO canola and the GMO cotton? Is that why? Yeah, it be, it it's, was used in, yeah, canola um, and and cotton. And also because it was beginning to be used more and more in non-G, non-GMO crops. Again, wheat. One of the great things that we did at Center for Safety, along with our colleagues, is we halted the approval of genetically engineered wheat. Okay, that's good to know. That- I mean, there's no GMOs in you know in wheat in your bread, pasta, you name it. So it was a big victory. And the same with rice, by the way. But that doesn't mean that Roundup isn't used on wheat. It is. It's used to to dry wheat after it's been harvested, it's called desiccating wheat. And so all of your wheat products, your Quaker oats. All those things have significant residues of Roundup in them. Uh, any oat product, any wheat product does because of this use of it. Okay, so that does get confusing to people out there that are just learning about glyphosate. They think if it says non-GMO on their label, then they're like, oh, it's free of glyphosate. But that is not true because the glyphosate is being used on the oats and the wheats to dry out the crops, correct? Correct. Correct. And in numerous other uses, in numerous other fruits and vegetables around, you, you name it. So this, this drives me a little crazy because, you know, we at Center for Safety are known for our litigation halting genetic engineered, you know, uh, crops. And we've done, as I just mentioned, I think we've done some really great work there. But non-GMO is not what you want. Okay. Organic is what you want. So let's explain that to them. Why is it organic that we want? non-GMO just means that genetic engineering wasn't used. Right. It does. I mean, you could have a non-GMO, you know, a a crop that's full of biocides, it's full of pesticides. Right. That's been irradiated, uh, that's been used in uh, grown in sewage sludge. So all it is is non-GMO. Well, that's better than GMO. Right. It's one step better. One step better. But that's not what we want. Right. We want organic. Organic is organic is what we want, because that's to the extent we can. And we've really worked hard every day every year, every week, every month to make sure that there's integrity of those organic standards. And it's not easy because the big companies keep coming in and trying to, you know, weaken and dilute the organic standards. And that's our, one of our job as attorneys and policymakers is to say, no, 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 we're not. Just because you're a big company and now you're going to go organic, right? Craft, for example, we're not going to let you change the organic to fit what you're doing. You need to change what you're doing to fit organic. Oh, good so for you guys. It's a constant struggle, right? Uh, but organic, yeah, it drives me a little bit bananas when people say, oh, yeah, non-GMO, that's what we want. No. Uh, now, we have, you know, we did, we're able to pass a bill, and we're now in court. So there will be mandatory labeling of GMO uh, ingredients. Oh. Uh, right, now, right now, the USDA has passed rules that will exclude a lot of stuff, that will use some language like bioengineered instead of genetically engineered that might confuse people. Um, that they were even for a while saying, oh, we can just put a QR code on it. One of those little QR codes. We don't have to say anything. You have to use in your supermarket, use your phone to try and find it in a website. So we, uh, we got a court to throw that out. Oh, wow. So, so, so companies aren't going to be able to do that, but we're still in court right now trying to fight for the right kind of language and the right kind of labeling. 
But the Congress did pass a law demanding mandatory labeling of genetically engineered ingredients. And so that's, you know, that's a, a step in the right direction. But again, what we really want here when we're dealing with these toxins and their impacts on, you know, our communities, our families, but also the rest of the natural world is organic. Organic is organic is the standard that we want, not just non-GMO, because non-GMO still allows all those other uh, pesticides slash biocides, all those other technologies that are excluded from organic. Okay, so right now in court, if you were to win whatever you guys are working on in court, would that mean that companies would have to say, we used GMO sugar, or this has GMO canola in it? That's correct. Yeah. That would be so nice. Yeah, the the current uh, regulations exclude oils, where exclude anything where you can't detect the GMO ingredient. Hmm. In Europe, they if you've used GMOs, you have to reveal it because makes sense. It does make sense. But here they're saying, well, if you can't detect it, but by what technology can't you detect it? Technology will keep being more and more sophisticated. So it's a very you know gray area. So there's there's a lot, and we're in court challenging that. So there's a lot of gray areas. But the bottom line is yes. On any product that's you know that's really using detectable you know GMOs, you're going to be able to see labeling. Okay, so good that you guys are fighting this. You guys are amazing. But let's now tell the listeners about organic because does organic mean that no glyphosate has been sprayed on the crops? That's correct. Okay, that and correct. organic also means no GMOs have been used. That is correct. Okay, right? genetic engineering is an excluded method. And uh, there are some exceptions depending on what's available, but glyphosate ain't one of them. You know, Roundup is not one of them. Roundup is not allowed under organic. So you can be sure that this, the the widest used biocide in the history of of mankind is not going to be in your organic produce. Okay. And does organic mean no pesticides or does it mean that there's a few pesticides allowed just they're completely different than the, all the pesticides allowed in non-organic. Yeah, it's a complicated subject, but all those pesticides that we're mostly worried about, those synthetic pesticides made by corporations synthetically, right? Those are not allowed. Right? Okay. Again, with an occasional exception, depending on uh, you know business practice, but basically, yes, not allowed. There are, are certain natural insecticides, natural herbicides that, that, that are allowed, yeah. And I, I, I really want to, you know, we talk about organic and conventional. This is the terms that are used that your listeners, you know, may be familiar with. Those really bother me. I mean, you know, conventional. You know, I think of, you know, like, you know, Henry Higgins and, you know, <laughs> in my fair lady, I'm a conventional man. You know, just, you know, I'm, I'm not controversial. I'm quite conventional. You know, uh, there's nothing conventional about having dozens of carcinogens on an apple. I don't know why that's conventional. Right. Right. Uh, you know, and we don't have labeling of that. We should have labeling in every supermarket in America. This, when you see a bunch of apples, it says the EPA has found up to 50 different uh, biocide pesticide residues on this apple or on these grapes, right? We don't have that, right? right. So you should really go into your supermarket. I've always, this is sort of a dream of mine. You go in the supermarket and there's, you see something that's from a country that's really not doing any regulation at all. And that's just you're like extremely contaminated. And then you move to another bin and it says, you know, moderately contaminated, right? And then you would go to your organic and it would say, all the tests have been made to avoid contamination. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about contamination, not conventional or organic, right? Organ- what does organic mean? Everything's organic. What we're talking about is non-contaminated or at least extremely limited any contamination on food versus massive contamination of our food. Let's just get real. That's what we're talking about. Those terms conventional and organic really hide and obscure the reality. They're euphemisms. That would We're be talking so, about contamination. That would be so nice if we could change the wording like that, because that would help explain this so much better to people. Yeah, and, and then now imagine labeling. So you could actually look down this, you know, this, this apple may contain this whole list of, of you know toxic uh, chemicals. You know, Well, not too many people are going to buy that apple if they actually saw that, right? right. But it, it's hidden. It's hidden, and then it's hidden behind the word conventional. Okay, so let me ask you something else about glyphosate. So a lot of people know, okay, I'm going to stay away from uh, wheat and oats because I've heard that those are sprayed a lot with glyphosate. I know to stay away from like sugar, canola, soy, corn, and cotton because those are five GMO crops heavily sprayed with glyphosate. But are there other 
key players in this that are sprayed with glyphosate too, like almonds no. or beans? Like how, how, <laughs> well, do, you, how do you know so what to look for? Well, it's, it's very ubiquitous. In other words, so not only is it used on a huge number of fruits and vegetables. So for, for example, uh, we've, they found it in Ben and Jerry's ice cream. They've even found it in Nature Valley bars, which is, you know, really good people trying to put some organic stuff together. It's been found in organic chickpeas. You know, it, it, it's just so ubiquitous that it's very difficult not to find it. And of course, you know, in our own bodies, and you, you know, it's, in, it's been found in our urine, our skin cells, you name it. And it's been found in, um, gosh, something like 85 or 90% of rainfall. Right. Because it goes up in the air. So, the, you know, it's almost impossible to imagine the, the coating of the earth, you know, with this poison um, that's happened and that's been allowed to happen because of the power of Monsanto and now of Bayer, which much to its regret now actually you know bought Monsanto and has, has paid for it dearly yeah so it's really hard, you know the, the best thing you can do is go organic and that's going to you know be your best chance to you know you're going to find glyphosate in almost anything and i would also note that glyphosate is the main ingredient of roundup right but it's the only ingredient there's a number of inerts in that formula and those formulas change. So one of the inerts is something called a surfactant. And a surfactant is a part of the biocide that is made to sort of stick to the leaf of the plant. So if it rains or there's irrigation, it doesn't lose that, that spray. And in a study that was done at the University of Pennsylvania, I believe, they sprayed in, a, in ponds and in live ponds, they sprayed uh, round, round, uh, just glyphosate in that pond, and they didn't find much mortality at all among the frogs. Hmm. there and and the tadpoles but when they sprayed the entire formula there was about a 95 percent kill rate wow and that was the surfactant interesting so what our epa has not done and i hate to tell your listeners this uh we'll, we'll get to something cheerful later on won't we you got a promise we will is that the epa has decided for decades now that they only have to look at the main ingredient they haven't looked at all these other ingredients much less the synergistic effects hmm in that formula, much less the synergistic effects of those pesticides with others that are being used at the same time on the same crop, right? Wow. So we have a you know major lawsuit going on right now. We call the whole formula. We are demanding that the EPA do what it should be doing under fit for the law I mentioned earlier that regulates pesticides and regulate the whole formula. Oh, good. They, they've really been cheating for years. And right now, with, and unless they look at that whole formula, we don't know of all the synergistic effects that that can have. So right. that's, you know, we're, we're, we're definitely going to do the best we can to make sure that loophole doesn't keep existing because it really isn't full regulation. And we're not really getting the whole story unless you look at the whole formula of every, each and every pesticide that you're regulating. That makes sense. Well, good for you guys. We're grateful that we have people like you fighting for our safety of food. Let me ask you something about glyphosate again, because every time I post about glyphosate, I get a bunch of people that come my way that are like, it's fine. It's safe. It doesn't affect our health. So I want to talk about how it affects our health. Can we start with the gut? Does it affect the gut bacteria? Glyphosate, it's a toxin and we really haven't done enough. You know, we do know that it's associated. I'm going to use that word well, there's numerous studies that have associated it, you know, with uh, everything from irritable bowel syndrome to kidney and liver disorders. And we've definitely seen a correlation between reproductive disorders. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, the hard evidence we have that's really hard evidence is with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Right. For those who have a serious exposure to glyphosate, you're looking at a 41% increase in, in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. But, I, you know, again, the government doesn't do much of this research at all. The company's certainly not going to do this research. So not just with Roundup, but for all of these other biocides, it takes independent researchers to try and come up, some independent universities. But remember, a lot of those universities are funded by the big companies. Right. Right. So it's really hard to get independent research. So, for example, the European Health Agency that was responsible for looking at the, the carcinogenic impact of glyphosate said it's a probable carcinogen. The EPA looked at it, and this is probably what you're 
people are telling you when you you know when they when they you know sort of trolling you there is hey the EPA says that it's not a carcinogen it doesn't cause cancer well I got news for those people that have been you know emailing you or or texting you we just a couple of years ago we went to court because they did a registration an approval an interim approval which they have to do for Roundup every few years they've got to reapprove it. So they did an interim approval saying it does not cause cancer, doesn't hurt endangered species. It's just fine. Well, we went to court and said, no, it's not just fine. It's killing all these endangered species. And so the EPA said, oh, OK, you're right. So they said to the court, give it back to us and we'll look at it because you're right. They, they found all sorts of things. But they said the one thing that we know we're right about is that it doesn't cause cancer. Wow. So we, we fought it out in the Ninth Circuit, our science against their science. Hmm. We said, yes, it does. It's directly related to non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And you, you, your own science says it does. You're just not admitting it. And the court agreed with us. Wow. And it vacated, let me repeat that for your listeners, it vacated the EPA's finding that is non-carcinogenic. It vacated that. It said that is illegitimate. That is illegal. That is unscientific. So anybody that continues to say that EPA says that glyphosate doesn't cause cancer, you tell them that's wrong. That's been, and the agency knows it. And it's been given two or three years to try and figure out another way to do this. As you know, they've already stopped residential use of glyphosate. I was right? going to say, that's a that was a huge win for you guys and a huge win for all of us. And that is why now you cannot buy Roundup on the store shelves, correct? Right. Right. If you just, uh, they, what they've come up now is a new formulation of Roundup that doesn't include glyphosate. They're trying to pawn that off now, sort of, sort of to keep the name brand, but get rid of glyphosate. And here's what makes that so cynical. Who's suing them, right? Because they've had numerous people sue them successfully. I mean, multi, multi, multi-million dollar settlements. They've already given away $11 billion to people that have sued them, right? I was going to say, and, and they sued them because of ca- having cancer, correct? Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma almost entirely, correct. There's 30,000 pending cases. That's so, what I heard. Yeah, so the people that are suing them are the people that were you know, using them as as people who were gardeners, people who were using them professionally and various, you know, doing professional, various professional services involving that, right? So what they're saying is, hmm, you know, we won't use it for residential use or non-commercial use, so not your, not even on your golf courses or your schools. We're not going to, we're not using because that's the people that are going to sue us. But we're going to keep it in agriculture because those farm workers, they're not going to sue us. A lot of them, you know, a lot of them are, are temporary workers. A lot of them don't have the money, don't have the capacity to sue us. It is so cynical, you know, saying because they're going to get cancer. They're the front line. We're getting the residues, and that's as I mentioned, massively expanded on our food for us and our kids. No, thank you. But these people and their kids are on the front line, those people that are working in these farms, these farm workers, and they don't care because they're not the ones that are suing. So that just shows you the mindset of Bayer and Monsanto. It just shows you, you know, what we're dealing with here. That is so sad. So we've taken off of residential shelves. We've, you know, like you said, can't do schoolyards and golf lawn and things like that. But it can still be in our food. It can still yep. be on all the crops that we are eating on a daily basis. How is that That's okay? Right. That's not okay. It's very, it's definitely not okay. And here's the kicker though, which is that, remember I said they went in front of Congress and said there was a special thing, you know, glyphosate that the plants would never ever develop resistance, that somehow Darwin would not exist, adaption would not exist magically. Well, that turned out to be complete nonsense. Right? They're, they're we, adapting? They're adapting like crazy. So much so that Roundup is becoming obsolete. They, they, you're seeing in cotton fields around all, and a lot of it because of GMOs, such an overuse of Roundup that these weeds, hundreds of millions of acres we're talking about now, around the country, now have like something like pigweed that is so thick you can't knock it over with a combine, and you can't kill it at all with glyphosate. So glyphosate is, and and remember that glyphosate was the most broad spectrum. So now what are they going to do? There hasn't been a new herbicide. Since glyphosate in the 1980s, they've tried. Yeah, so what so are they going to do? Well, what they've done is they're going backwards. So Corteva, which is Dow and DuPont. Corteva sounds like a nice pharmaceutical, doesn't it? Oh, take Corteva. That's just their, you know, that's their new name, Dow and DuPont, for their agricultural sector. They put together 2,4-D, which was part of Agent Orange. Oh, wow. 
and mix that with glyphosate. So the Asian orange gives it an extra, the Asian orange element gives it an extra punch. They call it duo enlist, very military time to, to kill. So that's their attempt to take over the market. And then meanwhile, Monsanto, now Bayer Monsanto, has pushed dicamba. Dicamba is another very, very toxic herbicide. And dicamba's got a, a and we, we just filed a lawsuit about, gosh, three or four years ago, we got it taken off the market. Now they put it back on the market, but we, we're in a lawsuit right now to take it back off the market. And the reason for that is that dicamba under wet and warm circumstances reconstitutes itself. You've sprayed it, comes back up, believe it or not, in a cloud and can travel two or three miles, come down on your organic field and kill it all. Come on your organic orchard and kill everything. So it is really uh, something out of science fiction almost. And it has caused this damage across the country. And that's why we were able to get it taken off the market and why we're going to be able to get it taken off the market again. But that is the next generation that's being used with GMOs and the things that, that Bayer and Monsanto are going to try and do. But I'm going to predict something right now. They're not going to be able to solve these problems. They're not. So, you know, with our help, with everyone else, everyone else's help out there by, you know, going organic, by getting the word out on the, the toxic nature of this stuff, by, by putting pressure on the members of Congress, on our agencies, state and local, federal schools, we are really going to be able to say no to not just Roundup, but to Dicamba and all of these toxins, right? Because they have no future. There are no new ones. They're developing resistance to it. That whole paradigm that we could exterminate these weeds forever and that they would never adapt, that we would nature was going to be defeated, that turned out to be complete nonsense. <laughs> right now, they're in big trouble agronomically. Mainstream weed scientists are panicking. What are you going to do? We don't have any new poisons. And the plants have gotten used to all the old ones. Mm. What are you going to do? So interesting. It's just a real challenge to the entire industrial agriculture paradigm, which is why those of us who support organic and agroecological solutions and non-toxic solutions, right? We are the future because their paradigm is a dead paradigm. It's a zombie paradigm because they're still putting these poisons out there. But it's only a matter of time before their entire paradigm of, of extermination as an answer uh, is has to be replaced by regeneration, biodiversity, smart agroecological methods, which we know, and organic methods, which we know how to do and which have proven to be successful. So, you know, it's not like there's some Goliath out there and, you know, you and your podcast and all the work you're doing and we're doing, we're little Davids. And no, no their whole paradigm is done. We're the future. If we're going to have a future, they're over, they're done. Okay, let me ask you this then, because every time I talk about glyphosate, every time I talk about GMOs, I always get the people that say, but GMOs are better for the earth. GMOs are better for all of us. GMOs are better for the growing population. And so what do you say to that education that's going on out there? Yeah, well, that's, that was the propaganda of the companies for quite a while. You know, it's safer. It's going to feed the world, et cetera, et cetera, right? And you know, I'm not going to put down my organization and all the other people that have done such a great job in, in fighting the GMOs. But one of the real reasons why it's, it's a failure and will continue to be a failure is because it had the science wrong. The GMOs is based on the idea that by simply manipulating the DNA of a plant, you can make it grow bigger, put more vitamins in it, uh, you know, make it safer, whatever, right? That turned out not to be true. It turns out whether it be us or plants or animals, it ain't just the DNA. The DNA, the RNA, the epigenetics, it's an incredibly complex system. So they were not able to change a single trait. Oh, photosynthesis will be more rapid. Oh, we're going to be able to plant uh, GMO crops in the desert. Oh, we're going to plant GMO plants have super, super vitamins. None of that happened. It's 30 years later. None of it happened because they got their science wrong. The DNA doesn't do that. The biology of the plant is infinitely more complex. That was Neanderthal science, that you could just manipulate DNA and get these miraculous results. Has not happened, will not happen. They did do, however, we got to give them credit for this, as I said before. They did perform this one trick. They found some bacterial DNA that made these plants, and they used it in corn and soy and a few others that you mentioned, canola and alfalfa. They were able to say, okay, when we spray this poison on them, they don't die. That's it. That's 90 plus percent of your entire GMO revolution not feeding the world. Quite to the contrary, we have 40 percent of our farmland in G GMO corn and soy that doesn't feed anybody. 
If you do that throughout Africa, if they push this technology everywhere, we're going to have starvation at a rate that's infinitely greater, even the one that we already have, because it's not feeding anybody except their bottom line, because they get money when it's used as a fuel and they get money when they feed these animal factories with it. Right. Right. It's the opposite of feeding the world. And it, meanwhile, it's putting hundreds of millions of more pounds of glyphosate, Roundup, and all these other poisons into our system, into our rivers, into our air, into our bodies, into our children's bodies. So, the, you know, it doesn't feed anybody. It doesn't do what it said it was going to do. You know, promise us this, promise us that. All false promises because they got the science wrong. So GMOs, you know, honestly, right now, you get rid of herbicide tolerant GMOs. Then you got a little bit of papaya over here, you know, maybe a little squash over there, and that's it. See, this technology is designed to increase the use of herbicides. That's why Monsanto and Dow and DuPont and the, and the makers of these poisons use it because it allows them, farmers, to indiscriminately use more and more of these poisons, toxins, right? And that's it. That's what the GMO revolution is, 90 plus percent of it. You don't read that all the time in the newspapers and probably your friends who are talking about feeding the world and all the other propaganda. That's it, folks. You'd get rid of those herbicide tolerant. You've gotten rid of GMOs. Okay, let me ask you something about that then, because we know um, the GMO crops of corn, soy, sugar, canola, cotton, alfalfa, like they, their DNA was altered to withstand the glyphosate. But things like uh, the squash, like you said, or papaya or potatoes, apples, they weren't necessarily altered to withstand glyphosate. They were altered a different way, correct? Yeah, that's right. So let's let, let's take the, it's called the Arctic apple, right? So uh, people decided that they wanted to make sure that apples don't brown as quickly once they've cut. Right. So they spent decades working on working on the RNA, not the DNA, the RNA of, of apple, the entire tree, actually, to make sure that they could put something in there that would mean when you cut apples into slices, they don't brown as quickly. And they said, we need this technology for people who can't make the commitment to an entire apple. Well, <laughs> my view is, men and women out there, if your partner can't make the commitment to eat an entire apple, probably you should question your relationship, you know? But um, the fact is, we know that there's something called lemon. You squeeze a little citrus <laughs> on the apple and it doesn't brown. Right. So here we have this front page news Oh, it reduces browning by so and so much of a you know, percent. The entire tree has to be genetic engineered. There are, and we've actually filed comments. So there's, there's dangers to that. And the, the result of all of this, of this big revolution that was supposed to feed the world, that was supposed to grow crops in deserts and end hunger, is a, an apple that browns slower? Really? So are those GMOs just as nerve wracking, I should say, as the ones that have been altered to withstand the glyphosate or not necessarily? Not necessarily. Okay. Um, you know, That's so, what I so, thought. Yeah. So, you know, there's a, for example, you know, a virus might hit some squash or some papaya and we've never litigated on that. Uh, you know, people will genetically engineer something to try and avoid that virus in, and, and try and survive it. You know, the only thing I would point out with those is, as we've learned, sadly, with COVID, viruses mutate all the time. Right. So you're not going to have a sustainable technology in trying to fight viruses with GMOs because the viruses mutate too quickly. It'll take you, it's like our vaccines. It'll take you so many years to develop against one virus. It mutates. It's whack-a-mole. You'll never catch up with, with the mutation of the virus by doing some kind of new genetic engineering. But again, you're talking about all of this tiny 0.1% of the genetic engineer out there. You'll read about it in the New York Times about some virus things or, the, or you know, or, or, you know, USA Today or whatever, but they never then say, oh, by the way, this is 0.1% of the technology. 90 plus percent is in herbicide and in, in making sure that they can sell and use infinitely more of their, of, of their toxins. And that's why they're in the business. So when we talk about the dangers of GMOs, it's those that are altered to withstand glyphosate and it's the glyphosate that is just such the danger because it is causing the cancer and gut issues and liver issues and all these other things you talked about that's right and but they've also designed them to uh tolerate and, and resist dicamba which i mentioned okay. before that horrible thing they've also engineered them to resist duo enlist that mixture of glyphosate and 2,4-D which was an element of agent orange so those are the three big ones that are fighting Right. As, as, as Roundup becomes more and more obsolete, obsolete, 
the other two, they're hoping these other two can take over that market, right? Our job, you know, the the, the two two pronged attack of the Center for Food Safety on this is one: we get labeling. Once it's labeled, it's over. Why would any member of the public buy a genetically engineered food when it offers them zero benefits and only risk? Right. Why would, why would they do that? Right. So wherever there's been labeling, like in Europe and uh, throughout Asia, thing, there is no GMOs because they know they can't survive an informed marketplace. Nobody's going to buy a product that does offers you zero advantages, but simply more risk. That's why they fought labeling so hard for the last 20 years while well, we fought for it. So that's one attack. And the other attack over here is to stop the approval of these very dangerous herbicides slash biocides. And we've done it with Dicamba. We just did it with Roundup. And we're going to do it on list as well. So we then stop the, the herbicides on which the entire technology depends. Right. Right. I'm amazed by this because people have won like $11 billion in court has been paid out. We know that it causes cancer, but yet people just freely eat it and feed it to their kids and aren't concerned about it. Why? Yeah, well, you know, this is your job and my job, you know, is that we have to get out there and let people understand. And and I think people are understanding. We're seeing the massive growth in organic. Uh, yeah. We're seeing, you know, we're seeing a huge and, and, and growing movement of people who understand the dangers, right, of these biocides. We understand what they're doing to our pollinators. And we know that you know, pollinators are responsible for one out of every three or four bites of our food. So people understand that it's these biocides that are killing them. People are more and more understanding of the uh, the impacts that they have on the neurological development of our children. Uh, so I think we're, we're seeing more and more education out there. We need We need more education out there about this, right? We need to understand it. But I'm telling you that the whole, the future is where we're going. Because it's a dead paradigm, right? There are no new herbicides. There Which I'm no glad to hear. Systems. They're done. You know, they're going to keep selling the last bit that they can to make the last dollar they can. But it's the it's the 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 extraordinary farmers and folks out there that are doing the agroecological work, doing the ecological farming, right? That's biodiverse and that's organic and that's regenerative. Right, they're they're finding and, and discovering the techniques. Many of them are old. <laughs> that they're bringing back. Use, that they're bringing back. Some right. of them are new. The USDA is doing some great stuff on soil. That's the future. We're the future, right? You know, we're the future of food. That paradigm that we could just spray poisons over the whole earth, and that that wouldn't have an effect on us. Remember, our war against nature is always going to be a war against ourselves. Right. Carlin, right? So because our war is here, it's always going to be a war and a war against our children. And, you know, it, it, we are part of nature. Our, our biology is, that biocide means us too, all of us, you know? So that's why I'm very, very optimistic. I'm very optimistic that in a few years, we are going to continue to see a massive growth in organic, a massive growth in regenerative and sustainable and ecological farming, and more and more the decline of industrial agriculture and, and this mode of industrial agriculture. Um, yes, we'll help it with our lawsuits and we'll get the education out there in our books and lectures and doing podcasts as, as you will do. And that'll all help because we got to push this thing out before it does any more harm, before it kills any more kids, before it kills, you know, we already have 1,673 endangered species that are there partially because of glyphosate. We can't afford too many more. We can't have glyphosate destroying the milkweed upon which the, and lose our monarch butterflies and a number of other butterflies species. That's just wrong we got to stop that so we got to push this i'm not saying we don't but we need to know in our hearts that the future is ours because there's no future in their paradigm that right. extermination paradigm that culture of death is over so let me ask you this you said okay we know the glyphosate affects the earth we know it affects human health we know it affects um, other animals out there so we are feeding though our like cattle our cows and chicken we're feeding them GMO soy, GMO corn, GMO canola, all of that quite often, right? And is That's that correct. is that glyphosate then being passed on through the meat, the eggs, the yeah. milk? The answer is yes. When we feed when when these pesticides get into the bodies of animals, they definitely then get into the meat of those animals, you know. I don't know about eggs, but definitely the meat of those animals, the answer is definitely yes. Okay. And so, again, we want organically fed animals. We want animals that are not fed those things, right? Um, 
one of the great struggles, and gosh, I wish this could happen. It almost happened. So the European Union has great GMO labeling, Mm -hmm. right? That's why there's no GMOs there. But they haven't yet labeled meat products that are there that have been fed GMO feed. If they were, and we lost by just one vote a few years ago, if the European Union were to say you need to label meat that has been fed through with genetically engineered corn or other genetically engineered feed, people would stop buying it. Yeah, they would. And that's important. That's important because they're getting a lot of that soy and a lot of those things from South America. And a lot of people are cutting down the rainforest to grow this genetically engineered soy in Brazil, for example, to ship it to Europe. Well, that would dry up immediately if 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 we were informed. Again, this is such an important concept for your listeners. You know, this technology cannot withstand an informed public. It cannot withstand an informed marketplace. If it's labeled, no one's going to buy it. Right. If the meat's labeled, no one's going to do it. They survive by hiding and by being non-transparent in what they're doing. Because they know if people really know about it, same with conventional. If we had those pesticides listed, are you kidding? Well, the bin in, in your in your supermarket, no one would buy it. I agree. You know what? One of the biggest problems I fight on a daily basis is people in their 40s, 50s, 60s saying, well, we never had this problem growing up and I'm just fine. And so I am trying to teach constantly that this is our generation's problem. My mom, when I was, I'm 48. So, you know, 40 years ago, she wasn't worrying about if the milk had glyphosate in it or if the Cheerios had glyphosate in it. She just bought what was on the store shelves. It wasn't her generation's problem. It is now our generation's problem to do better, to educate others that look, what's in our food is not what was in our food 30, 40, 50 years ago. That's right. And and I, I think that the, you know, the epidemics we're seeing now in a number of diseases, right, including childhood cancers, in, in, and that we're seeing not Hodgkin's lymphoma, for example, you know, the, the, the exponential growth we're seeing in these various cancers, and that we're seeing with a number of digestive problems, reproductive problems. So this is because of the, not because of 50 years ago, this is because of the last, you know, 40 years ago, one of the, the endocrine disruptors, right? These are chemicals that mimic our own hormones. And glyphosate <laughs> is an endocrine disruptor. Right. And atrazine, we're all, we have a litigation on that too. Atrazine is, of course, one of the most famous because it was creating hermaphroditic frogs. Well, if you look when these technologies came on board, they're recent. Those are kids that were born in the late 80s, 90s. That's that's what you're getting. You're getting a huge load of pesticides that the, the you know the boomers didn't get. Right. And then the children, you know, my grandkids, you know, the thing that I want to add to this is that we call, we talk about Buy American. Joe Biden's got this big Buy America thing. Well, then why isn't he supporting local organic? Right. I mean, American organic. If you go into your store, you're going to see so much of these organic products from overseas, which is bad for our environment because of all the travel and all the carbon that's used in the travel, right? Uh, most of it's okay because the international form, the international organic standards are pretty good, Right. But we should be having those here. Those should be homegrown organic. Right. So one of the things we're trying to do in the new farm bill is we want a huge investment in American organic. And that will help our farmers transition to organic, which is great for them, their health, the health of the farm workers, as well as the rest of us. So, um, you know, and 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 we're then we can use our best farmland for food, not for commodities that go into your automobiles or go in these horrible animal factories, right? Those should be used for food. We shouldn't be talking about yield per acre in America because you can have all this corn and what are you going to use it for? High fructose corn syrup, soy lecithin, that's what's used for, right? Right. These cars and things. We should be talking about nutrition per acre. I agree. Healthy, non-toxic nutrition. So whenever people say yield per acre, I go, excuse me, not interested. I'm interested in the standard by which how are we doing in America with nutrition per acre? diverse nutrition per acre. And if 40% of our cropland plus is being used for monocultures of genetically engineered corn and soy, we aren't doing so good. Right. On the nutrition front. We can do a lot better. Okay. I have so many questions that I could ask you, but I need to wrap up due to time. But I do want to ask you this because I think listeners are like, okay, I understand that glyphosate is an issue for the world and for animal life and human life, and it's not good for us. 
but what do I do? I'm just a stay at home mom. I just am a mom that works, you know, somewhere. I don't have a voice. What do I do in this? Yeah, well, that's a, those are very difficult, you know, questions. Uh, obviously, you know, the, the the first thing that we can do is, and if people can afford it, is to go organic. And I would urge people. I don't have it right in front of me. I urge people to check out the EPA's list. Uh, the Environmental Working Group has this. You can see it online as well. The, for the 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 dirty dust, the dirtiest uh, products, including those that are contaminated with glyphosate and others, avoid those. And of course, a lot of this is stuff you'd you'd think apples cherry, the stuff you're eating the entire thing of, well, watermelon are safer. So if you can't afford everything, at least for your kids and yourself, buy organic or d- certainly don't buy industrial, uh, you know, the, of the dirty dozen. And most of those are fruits and vegetables. You're eating the entire thing, pears, apples, you know, you name it, right? Strawberries, um, spinach. Yeah, right. So, you know, get, get informed. In other words, it's, it's spinach, exactly. So get informed. The second thing I think, which is important, is to work locally. Here's a secret that almost no one knows. In some states, you can ban a pesticide locally. Interesting. You, you can ban glyphosate. You can ban atrazine, right? In other states, you can ban it at the state level. The industry was so good, Carlin, that was so good at watering down the federal regulations that courts have held in a couple of our cases that state and even local banning of GMOs and of these pesticides is legal. Wow. So your state could do it. And in, in some states, they they don't let localities do that. But many states, they do. So we can actually ban, you know, Hawaii you know, banned several pesticides. California's banned pesticides. Mm-hmm. Federally approved, but the states, they're not preempted by the federal government. And in many cases, localities aren't preempted. So you can do that. You can go and work at the state and local level to get rid of those. You don't have to work at the federal level. Don't worry about Congress and all the corruption up there in, you know, well, where I'm talking to you from, the belly of the beast, Washington, D.C. You know, you don't have to worry about all that. Work locally, work at your state level and get these things banned. So if you're, you know, if you're politically minded, you want to get your people together, go to your state, especially if it's a state that would accept that more readily. You know, I, those would obviously include things like Vermont or Maine or you know, places where you're going to have a strong group of people that are going to support you. But even then, keep working on it. You know, um, so that's that you're not preempted. You're not the feds can't stop you. You can do it. I love that. I tell people all the time to support their local farmers. They are the best. They will tell you exactly what they use on their crops. I buy meat from a local rancher. He is the best. He tells me exactly what they're fed. So there are a lot of local people trying to do their best and they are more than willing to tell you their practices and how they grow things. And so I'm always encouraging people to go support those. Yeah, organic is the floor. It's the floor of the future of food we all wanna build together. Local, when we build it up, local is there. We want local food, organic and local. We want organic and humane, right? right? And biodiverse and very important, socially just. Yep. This is the house we're building, appropriate scale, not mon- huge monocultures. So when you think, oh gosh, think of organic, evolving that ethic for all of us to buy local, to buy humane. And I'm I'm president of the board, uh, certified humane. Uh, you know, so you know these are things we can do. Right. We can we can do it with our dollar by buying organic and certified humane and animal welfare approved. We can do that, but we can also do it through policy for those that are so inclined. Right. And of course, you know, I, you can also support groups such as the Center for Food Safety. Uh, you know, uh, we do everything we do pro bono. We're not lawyers who, you know, we have a great team of lawyers, but we don't, the butterflies can't pay and the pollinators can't pay and the farm workers can't pay that we protect and the communities that we can't, you know, the endangered species they can't pay. So we work pro bono. So we like to think of it, you know, hey, they need a lawyer. We're the lawyers, you know. And, and we're fighting for your right to, to see a label. We're fighting for your right to know. And so groups such as ours, and hopefully that's another way you can you can help by, uh, by supporting us. I was just going to say your organization, corporation is amazing. I thank you so much for everything you have done. You didn't even touch upon all that your um, Center for Food Safety has done. But tell people where they can go learn more about the Center for Food Safety, where they can read about it, things like that. You know, get on our website. You know, I know it's a little old fashioned, but we, we also have a very robust social media 
campaign. So you can find us on, now I don't really use these, so I'm not sure what I'm talking about here, <laughs> but I know we're on tick, something called TikTok. I know we're on Instagram. Instagram. You we're are, yes. On Facebook. You can find the Center for Food Safety on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and our website, well, you can, you know, check out all the things we're doing in a number of other areas, as you mentioned, you know, um, in uh, on our website, Center for Food Safety. And um, yeah. Like I said, you guys go follow them on social media. It's a wealth of knowledge and so much amazing information that they put out there for all of us and amazing studies and quotes and all sorts of things. So thank you so much for everything that you do. I really appreciate you being here. I always wrap up the end of my podcast because I am just ingredients. I end by asking my guests what they have found to be the best ingredient in life. What would you say it is? Oh gosh, that's a hard question. I, this is going to seem odd, but I, I'm just sort of, I love garlic. You know, I, you know, it's almost hard to put too much garlic in anything for me. So I, I, I love my, I love my garlic, you know, and I, and it's good for you. Yeah, high Fair. blood pressure. And I was gonna... Garlic is, is really their organic garlic, is, and and um, you know the um, I also you know the, the one of the things I, I enjoy the most is eggplant. Hmm. I'm a big eggplant guy, organic eggplant, and oh my goodness, cauliflower, roasted cauliflower is anything better than roasted cauliflower? We're gonna have that true, tonight. true. So cauliflower. Oh, isn't that great? Well, and you I know, love garlic too. It has so many medicinal properties that I cook with it in everything. It's a miracle. One last thing I'll just throw out okay. for your audience real quick is that quite often all of us are called consumers. You know, the American consumer. I don't like that. You know, fires consume. They used to call tuberculosis consumption because it consumed the bodies of the people that were ill. I don't want to be a consumer and we're not consumers. You know, we're creators. Hmm. Every decision we make, the food that we buy, the food that we grow, the food that we feed our children, food that we, is is either going back to that old culture of death paradigm, that extermination paradigm, or to the new future of organic and beyond. Every decision we make is creating that future or that future. I so love we get that. to decide. I know I'm not always on top of that mountain. I'm not going to kid you. Most of the time I am. Every once in a while, if I'm traveling, I find myself, you know, cheating at the margins. But at least we should take the moral responsibility now that we're not consumers. Whether we make the right decision or the wrong decision, whether we make the right decision for just ingredients, or sometimes we make the wrong decision. But at least we know. We know that, that it's not just a health choice. It's not just an environmental choice. It's a moral choice. I love that thought of being a creator. We're all creators, creating one future or the other. That is so true. Thank you again so much for being here. Like I said, I could have asked you 50 more questions about <laughs> great. It was great fun. It was. So thank you for um, informing us and teaching us. And thank you again for all that you do. Blessings and blessings to what all of you folks do and all your listeners do as well. Blessings. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. Remember to subscribe to the Just Ingredients podcast to learn more about your health and good ingredients to life. Plus, get daily tips at just.ingredients on Instagram.